Welcome back, everybody. I have a really special guest with me today, Dr. Jason Sifford. I want to turn our attention to composing a little bit and learning a little bit about you as a composer. So did you come from a musical family? My mom and dad both played guitar. They both sang. And then music was just on in the house all the time. You know, we had a record player with like, I'm, there was like a Reader's Digest collection of like the 100 greatest classical music in the world and you know some Joni Mitchell and Stan Getz and stuff like that they had like a pretty wide variety of things so I grew up listening to a little bit of jazz a little bit of country a lot of this folk song singer songwriter stuff um, and then of course going to church on Sunday I grew up in the Episcopal Church which had a very it had a very traditional hymnal so it's all four-part harmony if you have it in your ear it's just it just kind of comes naturally. And then the other part of it is that I grew up singing a lot. I always sang in choir. I'm not a very good singer, but I like doing it. And I had what I now understand to be probably the greatest high school choral director ever, because she had us spend three days a week doing Kodai solfege exercises. I just thought that was how people learned music in choir. And then I find out that like, oh no, that's not what people do. They just hang out and sing songs. Um, but there's all, so there was this incredible amount of training. We just had fantastic public school music programs. That's awesome. How and, and when did you start composing? When I was a kid, I was a bad reader, but I had a good ear. And so I would frequently guess. So if some, if my teacher gave me a piece, I'm that frustrating student who would come in and play something that sounded good, but was totally wrong. And so in my mind, I think that's a form of composing. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just making it up. And yeah, when you make up Mozart, your teacher's not going to be really happy with you. I'm just laughing and smiling because I was so relate to everything that you have just yeah. said it's like oh you are telling my life story here so yeah. that's awesome right. and then the other sort of thing i was going to say is just like when i started teaching i ended up with you know students who i just couldn't find a piece for and so i would sort of write something out for them to do i discovered that this is apparently what bach did that's what those little notebooks are who are the people who nurtured you as a composer or who inspired you and who continues to inspire you today? Probably the first that inspired me to compose would be Logan Skelton. I studied with Logan Skelton um, at Missouri State, uh, but he was the, the first pianist I had met who was also a composer. Uh, and he would play some of his own works every now and then. I just found that very inspirational to see that you know, that that composer pianist tradition is still very much alive. And then next, when I got to grad school, um, Joanne Smith, who was the pedagogy professor and my advisor at Michigan, really kind of encouraged it. You know, she herself wasn't a composer, but she was around like all of the people in, in the Francis Clark orbit. And so she was the first person that I came across that was like, well, if you've got an idea, then you just write it and then you just publish it and then it's out in the world. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know how that works. And so that's when I sort of got it in my head that like, oh, I could actually do it not for myself or my students. I can actually like, maybe other people would like it too. And then nowadays, like I, I am inspired by other people who, who do it. I will just say it. I think she's the best educational composer out there. It's Diane Heidi. I find her music fantastic. And I have like, when I study, I open her scores and see what she's done. Um, there are some others like that. Uh, I have not actually met her in person, but Nancy Faber, um, you know, going through, I, I taught a lot in Piano Adventures earlier in my career and seeing how she wrote for students, I thought was absolutely brilliant. And then looking at like, you know, some of the, some of the greats, like, you know, you look at these Kabalevsky pieces and like, he was good at writing for the students. Um, William Gillick, I think, you know, his music stands up pretty well. Um, a lot of it is looking at my students. I, 
what did what resonates with them because you can tell you know you don't even have to ask them you can just if they grab onto something it's like oh there's something cool about that um and so it's interesting there's a lot of stuff that i write that will be because a student really liked this one piece but now they need something a little bit harder or this other student needs something a little bit easier and so i feel like a lot of the way i work as a composer now is to try to translate this great thing for this student who's at this place in their journey. And so you'll find that over and over and over again. It's why I write a lot of what I write is in that transitional world between elementary and intermediate, because I feel like that's a, a really important place to be and there's not as much there. My own journey has been to try to learn how to write easier. Because good, easy music is hard. It's hard to be memorable when a student plays in a five-finger position. Absolutely. But I think it can be done. You know what I mean? Kabalevsky did it. So I know it can be done. Well, what are some of the most important things that challenged you to become who you are as a composer and to become a better composer? I think it's just that I'm never satisfied. I'm just so completely restless. There was a funny moment where I realized this about myself. I was an undergrad. My favorite thing in the world was like, you know, that that last Chopin etude, right? That C minor ocean etude. And I'm like, all right, this is gonna be a stretch. But if I can play this one flashy C minor torrential rain piece, I will be happy. And I worked my tail off and I played it and it felt great. And then I was right back to the same place in like a week. And I'm like, what's the next? found the next piece you know what i mean if i could just play yes i will be yes i will have arrived and and now i'm like that with composing it's like i just want to write like a really cool that some kids like playing and that the audience really thinks is fun and then i'll get a piece of ooh, what's the next one so yeah i there's there's a binder and a pile and sketches but it's always yeah and i think i think it's just me at this point i think it's just i'm just a little bit of a restless person and I'm always just kind of looking for like the next thing. I think it's just an important way for me to be. That's an awesome answer. So your compositions are really varied and there's a wide variety in all of your pieces, but they also have these defining characteristics. How did you go about finding and developing your unique sound as a composer? I think the funny thing is, so when I started writing, I was always writing in other styles. So I was writing like jazz pieces and it'd be like a blues piece or a swing tune or a jazz waltz. And then I actually wrote a Baroque suite because I, I wanted an early intermediate Baroque suite because I thought that was, there are 6 million minuets, but not enough gavats out there in the world. And then probably the first book that I did where I'm like, okay, this is probably what I sound like was The Creeps. And it was kind of a Halloween book that I did. And it was one of those things where like, I sat down with the idea of like, so what do, what do I sound like? Because at the time I'm like, I don't sound like anything. I sound like I'm a pretty good arranger. And honestly, it was one of those things where I looked at like what was available kind of on the shelves and in the market and trying to find a, a sound and a kind of student a kind of person that i can connect with and so you know i there were you know lots of completely wonderful pieces about sunny days and lots of completely wonderful pieces about kittens and and then like nice little waltzes and then like exciting you know race car things and so anyway, so there was kind of a vibe that you get from like, all, you know, really wonderful composers and pieces. But I came up on this idea and Creeps started life as a book called Underground, because it was all going to be about things that were underground, like moles and millipedes and gross things. I thought that would be kind of fun. Um, okay. This is around the time I think that like the Goosebumps books and, you know, Lemony Snicket was coming out and I'm like, oh, so this is a way that kids explore the world. They explore kind of the, I don't want to say dark side, but like not all happy go lucky thoughts. And I'm like, maybe there's something in there for me. And so that was kind of my point of entry. And then it turned into a Halloween book and then people really liked it. And it was something that I really enjoyed and felt comfortable writing. And also something that I felt that I could do that didn't like duplicate what other people were doing. It goes to what I was saying earlier. Like, I really want to respect people's time because if they spend time with their music, 
it's they're also not spending time with other things and so i just i feel i don't know a sense of obligation to give people something that they need and maybe can't find elsewhere that's excellent where do you seek inspiration for your compositions i devour enormous amounts of music i listen to a lot um and i try to listen to a lot of different things slightly obscure things but are still really interesting so i have that going on um and then i listen to a lot you know i i went through like a tom waits phase where he has this album called alice which is a really interesting kind of take on the alice in wonderland thing i do like i said i do a lot of musical theater so we just got done playing a, a sondheim review a couple of weeks ago um, I did Little Shop of Horrors last year, high school musical. But it's interesting because all of this stuff, I feel like just kind of goes in my brain. And then just because of the way I am, it, it has to go out. So I sort of get in these input modes and then I get in these output modes. And so part of the fun is, you know, writing a piece that will pull like from these different ideas and places and then try to you know, create a little world where they get to live side by side. Excellent. What are some of the attributes that you feel help people to become successful composers? I think it's going to sound weird. I think you kind of got to know the rules because I think composition is a lot about, well, it's a little bit like painting. Do you know what I mean? Like if you want to paint a really nice landscape, that's special and important to you. And if you want other people to understand it, then you kind of need to know how a tree is constructed. And so I love the idea that painters will like study, you know, how trees are structured or, you know, how what the shapes are in the human body or how this works and that works. I remember I used to team teach a class with an artist and he would talk about how artists see the world and they don't see the world as like, necessarily a person they'll look and they'll see like so there's a circle and then kind of a rectangle and then a trapezoid and then you know and they find the the beauty in filling out and decorating that structure and so i feel like composition is much the same you, you have to start with some kind of structure that you're very very um familiar with and very very comfortable with and then you take that and you do interesting things with it and to it and I think that's what really connects with people. I think you stop, I think it's difficult to connect with people if you miss one part of that equation. Like if you don't have a structure, then there's nothing to really hang on to. And like, you know, I think we've all had the the experience of like, if you go to a concert and somebody's playing something and you don't know the piece, if you don't know how long it's gonna last, it's kind of difficult to listen to. Cause it's like, so is this going to last five minutes or 20 minutes? Like, I don't, I don't know how to engage with this experience, but you know, I love it. Like in programs, like if I'm listening to something and it's like, you know, variations and then they like list all the variations and then it's kind of fun to like watch how everything goes through. I think that's really, really great. So I think structure is important. And of course, the other thing is like, you can't just have the structure because then you've written basically a copycat of thousands of other pieces out there. So, and that's, I mean, for me, that's incredibly difficult, but the most fun. Um, and I think when you find that sweet spot, it can be, you find things that are pretty special, I think. That's excellent. What advice do you have for aspiring young composers who want to try to emulate your success? I just write stuff and play it and have other people play it and then put it out there. Like there's that wonderful book by Austin Kleon called Share Your Work. I think he did another one called Think Like an Artist, but like the advice in there is, is better than any I could give, but it it really is that. It's, it's right, try to get better, whatever better means to you, do that and then put it out there and see what happens. And then, you know, you have to think about what success actually means. Like I still, don't really know what it means. Um, for me, it's that I seem to continue finding opportunities to do it and reasons to do it and places to put it. So for me, that's kind of what success is. 
for others, it may be completely different. I know, I know people who consider themselves fantastically successful because they write pieces that don't get played much, but maybe have been played in an extremely important venue in their community. You know what I mean? There's something really special for their middle school, for their orchestra in their area, for a concert that they give um, themselves. Uh, I know other people that success for them, honestly, is financial. And so they're trying to find a way to like write a bunch of stuff and then market it and then, you know, create communities around it and people that are really excited and part of it is about the music, but then part of it is about the community and having all those experiences happening out into the world. But yeah, just, I, I think people should just try, just do stuff. Those are great answers though. Those are really wonderful. What role do restrictions play in your composing? I mean, for me, restrictions are everything. I love a good rule just because I love the challenge of it. Um, my, my latest passion project is I write the music for a musical theater camp uh, that we do here in town, but it's fascinating because I have so many restrictions placed on me. Somebody else writes the script and the lyrics, and then she hands them off to me, and I have to write something that fits that and that a bunch of 12-year-olds can sing. And it all has to be learned in a one-week, half-day camp. Whoa. Whoa. And I'm producing the tracks for it. So it has to be stuff that I can actually like do a mock-up, you know what I mean? Like in a, in a DAW or something. So, and I, I, I love it to death and I spend hours and hours and hours on it. But I think for me, it's really important to, to have that. I work very well on assignment. I do not work well, not on assignment. If, if left to my own devices, I will start a million things, but Boy, a, a deadline and some rules, and yeah, it's pretty fun. Awesome. That reminds me of that Leonard Bernstein quote, what's needed to create great art is a deadline, a directive, and not quite enough time. And it's, and it's, I, it's so very, very true. I live that quote so much more than I wish I did. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I hope you have a great rest of your day, Jason. And um, I'll look forward to meeting you this summer. Thanks, Sam. Yeah.